Welcome to Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative, Lesson 3. This lesson covers Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the Heavenly Worship Service. My name is Steve Meeker. Now, if you haven't listened to Lessons 1 and 2 yet, well, go back and find those because there's a lot of information there that will help you with your understanding of Lesson 3. So kind of follow them in order. It will work better for you. The main reference for this study is a book called The Revelation of John, a narrative commentary by Dr. James L. Resigi. I've looked at several books uh, in preparing this class in this study. Uh, a lot of fine books on Revelation, but this one to me was outstanding. It uh, it spoke to me more than any other one that I had um, has seen. I think part of the reasons for that is, uh, first of all, Dr. Resigi has a, a doctorate in theology, but he's also extremely knowledgeable about literature. And he was able to pinpoint areas of the writing of Revelation that I've never seen anybody else do. And I think they're, they're very relevant in, uh, in our helping us with our understanding and appreciation of this beautiful book. And so I recommend that you get it for your library, but I'll give you a warning. Uh, this is the most, uh, probably the most scholarly book I've ever held in my hands. It is um, extensive in the references and footnotes, uh, and um, you're not just going to sit down and breeze through it. So um, I'll tell you, it took me uh, probably several months to actually breathe through it. I could kind of handle about two paragraphs at a time and let those soak in before I went on further. But that's where we've developed this study from. And I'm excited to say that Dr. Resigi has collaborated with me on developing a study guide for this class that you can print. Uh, it's called Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative, and you can find it at www.academia.edu, either under Dr. Resigi's name or mine. I showed this graphic uh, in lesson one, and if you'll recall, I was talking about how most books of the Bible have a definite starting point, a definite ending point, and in between the action pretty much travels in a straight line chronologically. Revelation's different. It does have a definite starting point and a definite ending point, but in between, well, it doesn't grow chronologically, and it doesn't even all stay on the same level. Uh, sometimes we're on the earth, as we were in chapters 1, 2, and 3. But then other times that scene shifts to heaven. And that's what we're going to be seeing in chapters 4 and 5 as we cover lesson 3. So just a little bit of a reminder not to expect Revelation to be chronological, not to expect it all travel in one neat plane. It tends to go many directions and on multiple levels at the same time. Well, this young couple is my great niece, Madison, and her husband, Brent. So why do I have their picture in this lesson? Well, about uh, three years ago, they got married and they contacted me and they said, we'd like to honor God by having scripture read at our marriage ceremony. And I said, great. Um, they asked me if I would do it and I said, I'd be happy to. And I said, what scripture do you want? And uh, we talked about some of the more traditional ones for weddings. And they said, you know, we want something different. I said, well, I've got an idea. See what you think of this. And I said, how about if we read the entire chapter four of Revelation, the worship service around the throne? Well, they read it and they liked the idea. And so that's what we did at their wedding. I read chapter four and I'll tell you, it was powerful, very powerful time. All right, let's uh, talk about chapter four just a little bit uh, before we jump right into it. A trumpet-like voice commands John to come up to heaven and see, quote, what must take place after this. Revelation chapters 4 through 22 combine past, present, and future events, providing an above perspective on the significance of past events, Jesus' death on the cross, future events, the New Jerusalem, and contemporary realities, the rule of the beast and Babylon. 
The vision places past, present, and future in the context of God's overall plan for history, making sense of what happens on earth because earthlier events are seen from an above point of view. That's from Dr. Rezegi's book. It, this makes me think of uh, recently I was at a football game and at uh, the halftime watched the marching band. It was a college game, so it was a really fine uh, marching band. Now, on the field level, all you can see are people marching back and forth. But to those of us up high in the stands, we saw that the band was making all kinds of uh, designs and configurations on the field. Uh, so it took an above perspective to appreciate that. Well, in a similar way, Revelation helps us tune in to God's above perspective about the end time events. So it helps us to understand those things from his perspective. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. To open a door is to cross a boundary not normally accessible. This open door allows John to cross a threshold from earth to heaven and to see an above point of view that interprets what happens on earth. This door is also a boundary between future and present. That's a quote uh, from a fellow named Leonard Thompson, and this was a quote that was uh, utilized in Dr. Rezegi's book, and I think it helps us to make sense of this open door. Verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby or chameleon. A rainbow shone like an emerald circled around the throne. So immediately, John is in the spirit. He's about to experience something different. He's going to see and hear what cannot be seen and heard with ordinary eyes and ears. He is seeing things in the spirit. Okay, we mentioned the throne a little bit in lesson two. Let's talk about it a little bit more. The throne is the central symbol of the entire book of Revelation. The occupant of the throne is the answer to the overarching question, who rules? Who is true Lord of this world? To whom does the earth belong? John is especially fond of the phrase, quote, the one seated on the throne, which is used more than a dozen times in Revelation, leaving little doubt that God is in charge in spite of the counterfeit claims of others. You almost get the impression that John is having trouble describing the splendor of what he sees. So he relies on similes and metaphors from the mineral world to describe God and the throne room in heaven that he's looking at. The one seated on the throne is like Jasper and Carmelian, and around the throne is a rainbow like, uh, uh, like halo that looks like an emerald. Jasper seen there on the lower left hand corner is generally clear but it can reflect many colors including red yellow green and even sometimes blue carmelian is a bright red mineral and emeralds are bright green these descriptions are john's ways of attempting to describe the splendor of what he sees emanating from the one seated on the throne extraordinary colors I, i've read accounts of people who have uh, seen uh, heaven and um, have come back and they describe the unbelievable colors that they see just so brilliant that like uh, if you can recall if you're old enough to remember my day from going from a black and white television to a color television and then again more recently from a standard definition to a high definition television um, that's kind of what he's dealing with and trying to explain what he sees on the around the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white 
and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Okay, here's an artist's uh, depiction of what this scene might look like. Uh, I don't know who the artist was. I found this on the internet, and uh, I don't know who to credit. Not only this, but other artwork that's displayed uh, in this series. Um, we're not selling anything. I'm offering this for free, so I hope they don't mind that I'm using their artwork. If they complain, then I'll take it off. But uh, you get an idea of what the scene might look like. Now, we'll talk about the four living creatures in a little bit as they show up in verse 6. Uh, but the elders, let's talk about them for a little bit. Uh, and why the number 24? In his book, Dr. Resigy, uh gives a number of different possibilities, even including the fact one for each hour of the day. Um, but, uh, you know, why, why 24 is not exactly clear, but their purpose, their function is very clear as uh, with their clothing, uh, their garments, their posture, what they say and do, they worship God round the clock, 24 hours a day. The elders' white garments are spotless without blemish, and they may represent moral and spiritual purity. A white garment is also a sign of victory. If you recall back in the letters of lesson two, that white garment showed up there as a sign to those who had conquered. Now, there was an important marker in verse 5 where it said, Out of the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Throughout Revelation, we're going to see this phrase repeated, only the further we go, there will be something added to it. Sometimes there's an earthquake, and then there's hailstones, and then huge hailstones. The further we go in Revelation, the more intense this marker becomes. So it tells us that we're at an important place in the, in the story of Revelation. Okay, what about the seven spirits of God that were mentioned in verse 5? It has also been mentioned in other parts of Revelation as well. What is this referring to when we hear the phrase, the seven spirits of God? Uh, in his book, Dr. Resigy, um gives several different possible explanations, but the most widely accepted understanding of the seven spirits of God is that they are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The Bible, and especially the book of Revelation, uses the number seven to refer to perfection and completion. If that is the meaning of the seven in the seven spirits of God, then it is not referring to seven different spirits of God, but rather the perfect and complete Holy Spirit. And I think that understanding fits better with the narrative as we see it used again in chapter 5. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. So these four living creatures, they form the innermost circle around the throne. Though their actual position is a bit unclear, they may not be stationary, they might be moving. They represent every section of creation. The ox from domestic animals, the lion from wild animals, the eagle from the birds, and a creature with a human-like face. Creatures are full of eyes in front and behind. Their exceptional vision allows them to see completely the holiness, omnipotence, and the eternal nature of the one seated on the throne. They combine characteristics of the world above with characteristics of this world. The idea of hybrids wasn't lost on ancient peoples. In fact, there were many hybrids noted in the ancient world, like the Sphinx, the Centaur, etc. These represented humanity's divided nature, 
part human and part beast. Elsewhere in Revelation, there are also hybrids. Chapter 13 shows the sea beast, which is part sea monster and part human, and the demonic locust in chapter 9, verse 7 through 11. These represent humanity in collusion with the world below. But the four living creatures surrounding the throne are different. They represent traits of this world with the world above. Their hybrid nature is emblematic of the world in perfect harmony with its creator. In other words, the world as it was intended to be. All right, continuing Revelation chapter 4 with the second half of verse 8 through verse 11. Day and night, they never stop saying that they is referring to the four living creatures. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. A lot to uh, look at in these, this little section here. So we start off the, um, the hymns that are being sung here by both the four living creatures and the 24 elders celebrate God's attributes and his work. And they also clarify why God is worthy of worship. The creature's primary activity is worship. They do this day and night without ceasing. Their unending worship is the natural position of the creation in the face-to-face -face encounter with its creator. We have three sections of three. Remember in our first lesson, we talked about how significant the number three is, how it refers to God when we see threes and we see holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We got three sections of three there. The acclamation of God's unlimited power, eternality, and control over history is a reminder that the power and structures of the dominant culture do not control all things. God is beyond time. God is transcended. John inserts his own interpretation of what he sees. The living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to God. We have a little artist depiction here of what this scene might look like. As the creatures sing their hymns praising God's holiness, the elders add three acts of obeisance as they prostrate themselves before God, worship God, and cast their wreaths or their crowns before God's throne. John again refers to God as the one who is seated on the throne and the one who lives forever and ever. The elders then say a verse praising God for his work as creator. I like the King James version in this particular section. I'll talk more about the King James later, but King James says, Thou art worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. In his book, Dr. Rezegi makes an interesting comment about how these verses relate to something called the imperial cult. The imperial cult of ancient Rome identified emperors and some members of their families as being gods and as divinely sanctioned authorities of the Roman government. The citizens were expected to demonstrate pious respect to the emperor and his decrees. I suppose it's easier to get people to do what you want them to if they believe that you are God. And so that's why the emperors wanted to be seen as gods. It's also why Christians uh, were in danger because they refused to recognize the leaders, the emperors as gods. 
has not gone unnoticed that Revelation 4.11 is a rebuke to those earthly rulers who usurp themselves as gods. That was very common in the Roman world. It's not unheard of today. Looking at you, Kim Jong-un. The elders who are rulers themselves sit on thrones and acknowledge and worship the one true sovereign, the Lord and God, the creator of all things. The theme of God as creator forms an important link with chapter 5, which tells the story of creation rescued and redeemed by the Lamb. So chapter 4, we've seen the beautiful worship service begin as God is worshipped, the one who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. While chapter 4 claims God as creator and sovereign ruler of the world, chapter 5 acclaims God as redeemer and rescuer of the creation. This chapter has three parts, each beginning with I saw, verses 1, verses 6, and verse 11. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw in the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne a scroll written on the front and back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a powerful angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. So I began weeping bitterly, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look into it. So in verse 1, John sees a scroll in the right hand of the one who is seated on the throne. The right hand of God throughout Scripture is symbolic for God's power. It's a metaphor for God's saving deliverance and his just judgment. We see that from all the way back from uh, Exodus. The scroll has writing on both sides and is sealed with seven seals. Seven is the number of completeness and our perfection. These seven seals indicate that once this document is opened, God's plan for the destiny of creation can be fully completed. The mighty angels in verse 2 proclaims in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seal? This call is heard throughout creation, therefore in heaven, earth, and even under the earth. It's interesting how this is phrased. Let's look into this a little bit more. Usually, seals are broken and then scrolls are opened in that order. The angel's call reverses the order, open the scroll and breaking the seal. Now, there's a literary name for this. Writers call this histeron proteron, or last first. Perhaps it's a way to heighten our anticipation and also to focus on what's really important, opening the scrolls. This literary device occurs frequently in Revelation. John used it in his writing style considerably. The search for someone morally and spiritually fit to open the scrolls appears to end in disappointment. No one is found. This heightens the dramatic tension, for the person who opens the scroll not only reveals its content, but also brings God's plan into completion. John weeps bitterly as expectations are raised, then dashed as God's destiny for humanity goes unfulfilled. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Then the one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Before we go on to verse 6, let's talk about that a little bit. One of the 24 elders breaks the tension by telling John, Do not weep. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. The words has triumph are past tense, meaning this event has already occurred. Jesus died on the cross and yet conquered over evil through his death. Now these two titles that we see here, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David, those both have roots in the Old Testament. Lion was always symbolic with power. 
not only in the Old Testament, but in the ancient world completely. And Root of David is a reference to David's father, Jesse, and the branch or shoot that emerges from it. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Now, these two phrases together set us up for the appearance of a militant, conquering Messiah. If you were going to go to uh, an event and someone came on the stage and said, I want to introduce the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, well, you'd be expecting this strong personality to pounce out and make strong pronouncements from throughout the auditorium. That's not quite what John saw. Look at verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all of the earth. Well, John heard the announcement of a lion, but he saw a lamb. Two different descriptions of the same person, Jesus Christ. I like this quote from Dr. Rezegi's book, Why is Christ Worthy? Christ is worthy because he conquers in a completely different way from the powers of this world. His power is not to destroy or oppress, but a power that is manifest in his love and in his willingness to give all of himself for the sake of those whom he loves. In that power lies the liberation of his people. The word lamb is John's favorite metaphor for Jesus. Uh, John uses the term lamb 28 times to describe Jesus' person and work. And this is not an accidental number, it's significant. How do you get 28? Seven times four. Well, seven is the number of completeness and perfection. Four is the number of the earth. Thus, seven times four is symbolic of the worldwide scope of Jesus' complete and perfect victory. That is a quote from another author named Richard Bauckham uh, that was quoted in Dr. Resigy's book. Earlier, we mentioned the seven spirits of God, and the best understanding of that phrase is that it's an indication of the Holy Spirit third person of the Godhead. Now, when we saw it in uh, in chapter 4, verse 5, it was stationary before the throne. But now, in chapter 5, verse 6, it's mentioned that the seven spirits of God were sent out into all the earth. Um, the I'll read this quote here. The spirit is not stationary before the throne, as in chapter 1, verse 4, and 4, verse 5, but is sent out into the whole earth on a mission. The all-seeing all-knowing lamb is the embodiment in the world of the fullness of God's spirit. Now, what did Jesus say about when he left? He said, uh, this is in a quote from John 16, 7. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And so that's what we're seeing exemplified at the end of verse 6 the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit, being sent into all of the earth. Revelation chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. He went, this is Jesus, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Okay, we got a lot going on in this verse. So at the beginning of verse 7, Jesus came and took the scroll from the right hand of God, from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He didn't need permission. He'd already demonstrated the necessary requirements, his death on the cross and resurrection. He had took, As he takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders worship the lamb. Each are holding two props, a, a harp 
and bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We'll come back and talk about that at a later time. Harp occurs three times in Revelation and is associated with songs of deliverance. Bowls of incense remind us of Psalm 141, verse 2, where the prayers of, people, of God's people are likened to incense. The creatures and the elders then give a new song of worship to the Lamb. New song is referenced in Psalm 96, verses 1 through 3. What John hears conveys at the deepest level what he sees. Just as God the Creator is worthy of worship, Christ the Redeemer is worthy to take and to open the scrolls. Let's look at this song from verse 9 and 10 again. You are worthy to take the scrolls and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So we have uh, some interesting words here. Two consequences of Christ's action are detailed in this song. First, because of his sacrificial death, he has ransomed or purchased people for God. And this is the language of the slave market, where slaves were purchased or redeemed for a price. And these aren't just Hebrews. These people have come from every tribe and language and people and nation. Second, we have another Exodus reference here. Exodus 19 is echoed. As Christ's followers are made into a kingdom and priests for our God, as they are released from the bondage to sin. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And so in verse 11, John looks and he hears the voice of many angels. The concentric circles around the throne are expanded to include an incalculable number of angels, 10,000 times 10,000, that's more than 100 million. With full voice, they praise seven of the Lamb's attributes. Worthy is a Lamb who was slaughtered or slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The Lamb's taking of the scroll results in him receiving complete sevenfold praise. This sevenfold praise leaves nothing wanting in the angel's acclamation of the Lamb, thus forming an appropriate climax to the heavenly worship service. The attribute of wealth is really striking in that list, that sevenfold list. This is the only place that ascribes wealth to Christ. In what way is the slaughtered lamb wealthy? Wealth and self-sacrifice appear to be opposites, but the wealth of Christ is a different kind of wealth, and it contrasts with Babylon's wealth. Christ's wealth is gained through self-sacrifice, not self-aggrandizement. His wealth is a result of voluntary slaughter on the cross, not willful accumulation of material riches. He possesses the true riches, yet it takes an above perspective, a God-centered view, to see this paradox. From below, it appears that Babylon has all the wealth. Reminders of the church at Sardis, I believe it was in the last lesson, that uh, we're told that even though they didn't have a lot, they had, they were wealthy compared to, uh, for they were wealthy from God's perspective. They had what was important. Well, that's uh, the same type of wealth that Christ has. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. 
Well, it would appear that all has been said that could be said about the Lamb, yet not all have spoken. Finally, all the creatures in heaven and on earth and even under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, all creation is joining in. It's striking that this list even includes all those under the earth. That would include the world in rebellion, the underworld, hell, and all the angels that rebelled with Satan. Even though the underworld is in rebellion, they must join in. The Lamb is now included with the one who sits on the throne. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. At the beginning of chapter 4, the elders spoke first, and then the creatures. At the end of chapter 5, the creatures speak first, amen, and then the elders fall down and worship. The service has come full circle. The close of the worship service is a reversal of the opening with an important difference. God and the Lamb are now the center of focus. The heavenly worship service in chapter 4 and 5 form a contrast with the earthly service of lament that we're going to see in chapter 18, the funeral service for the fall of Babylon. Chapters 4 and 5 establish the fact that Christ's death on the cross is the decisive event that influences the course of history. The God-centered above point of view offers a different understanding of power and strength. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. This is really one of my favorites, uh, chapter three, which covers the heavenly worship service of uh, Revelation four and five, such a beautiful vision of what's happening in heaven. Well, you want to be with us next time, Lesson 4, when we get into the judgments of the earth. Beginning on Chapter 6, the seals are opened and we see the judgments coming on the earth. And also Chapter 7, which shows the sealing of the saints. This is a very uh, interesting part of Scripture, and so I hope you'll enjoy us then. Until then, I'm Steve Meeker, and thank you for joining us.